my heart toward God and uh, the affections and, and the like. So um, that's an important part of it for me. Mm-hmm. Are you are you finding it harder in this technological age uh, with all the distractions inherent in this period uh, to cultivate that kind of yeah. a heart to stoke your affections for the Lord? And are you finding that in your students? Yeah. Or is it just the same throughout all the ages? No, I, I no, I'm telling you, I got a, I got up five o'clock this morning again. I, I'm an early riser, and the uh, first thing I'm inclined to do is go online and, and check, yeah. uh, you yeah. know, CNN and the Huffington Post, yeah. and, uh, yeah. and uh, you know, so my 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 instinct is not to turn my heart toward God. And one of the things I have to do is uh, uh, put online uh, some prayers, uh, mm-hmm. so that I uh, I discipline myself to click on uh, some morning prayers and to pray them. Uh, so. Uh, the internet can be a means of, of, of you know, it's it's not a neutral thing, and right. it, it can be a means of, and it certainly is a means of, uh, can be a means of facilitating con- uh, conversations with people around the world and being aware of the needs of the body of Christ. So it's not all bad, but I, I do think that uh, just the sense of being quiet and alone and uh, not being distracted is increasingly difficult uh, when I've got my my smartphone and my uh, my laptop with me at all times. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I, I think I, I think we need to be addressing theologically and in terms of spiritual formation uh, the questions of what is all of this doing to the way in which we not only process information but the way in which we we uh, monitor our own. Uh, inner lives and our right. consciousness. Uh, there are profound challenges there. Mm. And uh, we've done a lot with, uh, uh, you know, I've, I've said recently that the most important liturgical innovation of the last 30 years is the screen. Uh, mm. You know, people don't know what it's like to hold hymn books anymore. Mm. <laughs> a lot of my students, uh, I, I, I have, uh, when I'm teaching, and I always have a large class of about 120, 130 students, and uh, we always sing a hymn at the beginning of class, and uh, uh, we put it on the screen, and we'll sing, you know, my hope is built on nothing less, or uh, this is my father's world when we're talking about uh, creation care, that kind of thing. And I had a, a young student, and she had just been saved about three years before through Campus Crusade, somehow ends up in seminary, and she said, where do you find hymns like that? And uh, she 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 did not own a hymn book, oh, gosh. and was and and had gone to a church for since she'd become a Christian where they simply didn't have hymn books. You know, mm. well I can tell her about cyber cyber hymn only yeah. she can get yeah. access yeah. there. But um, uh, it, it, it's very important that we wrestle with the fact that uh, people's understanding of um, of the words of the faith uh, do not come so much anymore from the printed page uh, as, a, as a hard copy that we we hold in our hands. And what does that mean for the way in which not only we process information, but the way in which we think about God and the way we feel about God and, and all of that? Very important. Stuff. The things you're saying are very interesting because, you're, you know, we've asked you a bunch of questions about piety and being pious and, and, and holding to that kind of life. Uh, and you've talked a number of times about singing. It's so interesting to think about the role of something yeah. as simple and humble as singing a hymn yeah. and cultivating one's faith, you know. Uh, and yet, that's probably one of the first things to go in the kind of Christian intellectual environment yeah. that really hungers for cultural respectability. Yeah. The, the, the practice of something as simple as singing a hymn to yourself in the morning. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Those things keep us humble and... Yeah, focused on essential things, I guess. Yeah, yeah. I have a lot of uh, interaction with Mark Knoll on uh, hymnody because he yeah. and I both both love hymns. We have a we had an interesting argument going for a long time. Um, my uh, both of my parents died in the last decade, and uh, each of them had requested that at their funeral service we sing "I Come to the Garden Alone," uh, which I kind of like. But uh, Mark Knoll uh, has always said that's kind of uh, Pious sentimentalism, mm-hmm. uh, uh, very superficial. You know, he walks with me and he talks with yeah. me and he tells me I am his own. Yeah. And uh, 
so uh, I would twit him about that, and uh, I'd, I'd, I'd send him an email and say, you know, I just, just turn on Christian radio. I was driving along, and uh, they, they started singing that, and, and I really liked it. Uh, remind me again why I'm not supposed to like it, you know. And, <laughs> but uh, he told an interesting story, and I, I think these hymns do nurture us in ways that I, I, I hope that we can rescue some of the, the, the old stuff. Um, he, he wrote to me at one point and said, you know, I, ju I just heard a, a Chinese pastor who had been through the Cultural Revolution. Uh, it's part of a well-known story. But he said, uh, uh, I just wanted you to know that uh, he, he talked about being in a, a, a kind of a detention camp where every day for several years they would lower him into a pit filled with human waste. And, and he would have to spend the day in the meaningless activity of shoveling human waste. And he said what helped him to survive was that he would, they would lower him into that pit and he would sing over and over again, I come to the garden alone. And he said he refused to allow his persecutors to define where he was. Oh, God. And that he used that hymn to, uh, to define uh, the reality that he was with Jesus. You know? And Mark said, Almost like the hymn. <laughs> you know, <laughs> Take it back. But, uh, <laughs> but you know, the, uh, I, I think the good part, just to stick with hymnody, and, and the good part of the screen is that it has uh, it has lifted our eyes, uh, and and it's freed up our hands. And I do think that an important part of worship uh, is really to to uh, to put our bodies into it. And so with the screen, we're looking up and we're we're raising our hands. And we're singing songs of praise. And, and I think there's a, a new kind of spirituality that emerges out of that. Hmm. If I have a, a criticism of one defect in it all, I, I, I really do think praise songs have been a, a, a revival of psalmody. Uh, many of them are the psalms, mm -hmm. uh, that's lines from the psalms, and, and that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, the fact that it's repetitious, somebody said, what do you, you know, what do you do with all this new repetitious stuff? And I said, you mean like Kyrie, Kyrie, Kyrie? I mean, you know, the, yeah. uh, the church of the past often did. And he, even the, 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 the founder of Fuller Seminary, Charles E. Fuller, his radio program, Heavenly Sunshine, Heavenly Sunshine, you know, a whole bunch of Heavenly Sunshines over and over again. <laughs> I mean, we had a lot of repetition in the past as, as well. But uh, if I have a criticism of the new style of music, and I think this is changing in recent years, but it's that there's no room for lament. Uh, the, the, the wonderful thing about the Psalms is that they give us permission to say, where are you, God? You know? And as we watch, we're, 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 we're doing this conversation during Haiti's uh, terrible, terrible, desperate crisis. And you look at that, and uh, you really want to say what the psalmist says is... Uh, Lord, we cry out to you. How come you're not answering? You know, where are you, Lord? And it's okay to pray that because the Bible gives us the words with which to. And we need more lament. Uh, people sometimes come to church, and the first thing they need to say to God is, "Are you asleep? Uh, you know, where are you? Why are you hiding your face from me?" And uh, we we need to integrate that into our worship as well. So. One of the most helpful things I, I, I experienced, a very simple point, but uh, the great Robert Munger, who was a wonderful uh, Presbyterian pastor on the West Coast, uh, associated with Hollywood Presbyterian and uh, uh, Henrietta Mears and that, that old, old, older kind of evangelical Presbyterianism, uh, he once said to a group of us, um, we don't have to get into a holy mood in order to pray. That there are times that, that the, the, the best thing we can do is, is, is to quiet, go into a quiet place and say, God, I don't feel like talking to you. Um, I'm not even sure I feel your presence right now. And that uh, it's okay to give that kind of honest expression. And that may be the best prayer we can lift up that day. And indeed, sometimes that was the best the psalmist could come up with. And so uh, I think that too has to be a part of our spirituality. Uh, honest lament, complaint accusation, uh, knowing that, uh, that in the final analysis, we, we bow in humility before the God who sometimes we just can't understand and uh, not even sure we like what we're experiencing. If I may shift gears just a little bit, you also mentioned in um, your lecture yesterday your 
participation in dialogue <clears throat> between Catholics and evangelicals. Obviously, you were one of the people who endorsed evangelicals and Catholics together in 1994. And I wondered, as a participant in that, where you see that movement headed uh, with the death of Richard John Newhouse last year, if you see it um, losing steam or... Yeah, some of the uh, some of the main leaders in that, uh, you know, one on both sides, uh, one each on on each of the sides. Richard Newhouse on the one side, and Bill Bright on the other, uh, are no longer with us, and so it was very helpful for those of us who uh, who needed some uh, senior leaders uh, to give permission. I mean, just parenthetically, I want to say back when I got involved in Evangelicals for Social Action. Jim Wallace and all of that in the very early 70s. Uh, I uh, I got in a tr- little bit of trouble at Calvin College for uh, heading up the local chapter of Evangelicals for McGuffer uh, in the early days. <laughs> uh, and uh, you know, I got 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 identified with that. But but there came a time in 70 73 when a group of us gathered at the Y in Chicago and issued the event, the Declaration of Evangelical Social Concerns. And it was some of the younger African Americans and, uh, and Jim Wallace and Don Dayton and people like that. But it was also Carl Henry and uh, Vernon Grounds and uh, 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 Gabeline, uh, uh, Frank Gabeline and, and folks like that. And it was so important. I, I think they were a little nervous about what, where some of us were going with this. But what they what they were saying by joining in on that was, this is an important topic, you know. And I think what uh, Bill Bright and James Packer and others did in teaming up with Father Newhouse and uh, Cardinal Avery Dulles and and others in uh, bringing evangelicals and Catholics together to uh, uh, talk about uh, some of the things we have in common and some of the clarify some of the things that have been misunderstood between us was uh, it's okay to, to be in that kind of conversation. And uh, it's okay to do what Francis Schaeffer had always talked about, co-belligerency, that is to to work together with people with whom we don't always agree on all the issues, but we find common cause. And in the process of that, maybe come to understand each other's theology uh, a little better so that we don't bear false witness against each other. And uh, that's very important. Uh, the death of Father Newhouse, he, he was such an important figure because he'd been a Missouri Center Lutheran pastor and uh, uh, always, always insisted that he was faithful to Luther. Uh, we had big arguments. What, uh, what was the Reformation all about? Many of us believe that, yeah, the, 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 the key doctrine that was disputed was justification by faith alone. But in the subsequent centuries, uh, we developed along different ecclesiological lines. And so papal authority and Council of Trent and things like that also got put into the mix uh, so that it wasn't just as Father Newhouse insisted, once Rome would allow me to preach justification by faith alone as a, as a Lutheran, I, could go, I, I had to go back to Rome. Uh, a lot of us disagreed with him on that. But, but on the other hand, he was, he was a person who really understood us. He, he understood mm-hmm. where we were coming from theologically, and that was a, a very important part of it. And, and we've learned so much. Uh, Father Tom Roush, who's a Jesuit, I ran into him in uh, O'Hare Airport a couple of years ago. And uh, he said, what, what are you doing here? I said, I'm on my way home. I'm, I'm, uh, I, I've just been at Notre Dame for a couple of days. And he said, oh, really? He said, I'm on my way to Wheaton. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and, and you think, we, we both just laughed. I mean, the irony of that. Uh, so these are the, the good things that have happened. And uh, that, I, I hope that the momentum can keep going. Uh, but I, I really think that much of it uh, isn't just about these major documents and uh, very visible national leaders like uh, Jim Packer and and Newhouse and others coming together, but it's it's really to put our blessing on uh, local conversations, uh, what Tim George calls the ecumenism of the trenches, and that is uh, a local Catholic parish and a local evangelical parish uh, getting together and talking about how we can work together on certain kinds of things and uh, and how the 
the business person who's an even